You're listening to the Bible Roots Podcast with Pastor Randy Frazee. If you're a church leader looking for creative ideas to help your church engage more deeply with the Bible, this podcast is for you. And now, for today's episode. Well, welcome everyone uh, to a podcast that is all about Bible engagement. We've designed this podcast for anyone who longs to see people, including yourself, effectively engage God's Word. Everybody is welcome to dial in, but our crosshairs are on pastors and church leaders. What we want to do in this podcast is to stimulate your thinking and give you creative and effective ideas on how you can see the people you lead engage in God's Word in such a way that it transforms their lives, not only their lives, but the lives of their family, their church, their community, and even the world. And so this is The Maiden Voyage. Uh, episode one. And in this first episode, uh, I want to establish the case for Bible engagement and why it should be one of our very top concerns as pastors and church leaders. And I cannot think of a better guest to invite to this maiden voyage of this beautiful podcast than my good friend, Callie Parkinson. Callie, thank you for being the first. I can't think of anybody better for being a part of this podcast. Thank you, Randy. I'm happy to be here. This is just a real gift to me. Yeah, well, we can have a conversation for hours like we've done in the past and forget that we're even doing a podcast. So I'll try to be mindful of our audience because you and I have so much fun together. Can you start off by just kind of telling people a little bit about who you are, who, who you are and where you've been? Yes, well, I've been, I've had many journeys, but my professional journey was at Allstate Insurance Company where I spent 25 plus years uh, in different jobs. I was in finance, I was in planning, I was in research, always, it was always sort of numbers related, but I wound up in the communications department at the end. Uh, And uh, then Willow Creek decided to offer me a job. So I wound up as their communications director. And, uh, and then this consultant I had worked with at Allstate knocked on my door. He'd never heard of Willow, just wanted to know what I was doing, came out. I tried to get him to talk him into doing something free for us and he decided to help us and reveal was born this guy was one of the top people in the country at uh and you know him eric ernst in, in market research and he uh he gave us four years of pro bono work and reveal was a survey with willow at first and now now it is what it is so i followed i was the communications director at willow then i went to the wca uh and uh, the survey sort of exploded and then uh scott beck from glue purchased the intellectual property um a few years ago and so now i'm with uh glue yes and um scott is going to actually be the second uh person on this podcast to talk about how people grow and uh and reveal is just such an important um an an important contribution to the church today and that's what we want to build this case around and um uh, for Bible engagement. And so I want to chat a little bit about how we, our stories collided. Uh, and it was uh, at Willow. Uh, mm-hmm. I came to Willow to be a teaching pastor and to focus on spiritual formation and developing community. And uh, I was super excited to get in a room. And the very first time I, you come to your recollection, because the first time I remember us really diving in. I mean, I think we met and all that, but huh? we were like in a room with no windows with uh, maybe uh, yes. Greg Hawkins or maybe Eric Arnson. And you guys huh? were debriefing me in this s- almost closet, you know, <laughs> and uh, we we got after it. And I just, my my heart was pounding. Uh, what's your recollection of us? I, I'm remembering that was before you were hired. I mean, yes. you were kind of like checking things out, right? And we were one of the things you were checking out. So, and I think, I think, I hope, I believe that, that the fact this work was going on at Willow um, was a real draw and was one reason that you decided that, hey, maybe this would be a good fit for me. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on. And while you were at Willow, uh, you and I connected on many fronts. I remember some media things you and I did together that were pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, but I, when I was communications director, then I went to the WCA and we continued to connect as Reveal became uh, more and more robust. You helped us with a number of things, uh, uh, 
based on my recollection. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I had done a product, a project with George Gallup called the Christian Life Profile Assessment Tool. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was super interested. And to be honest with you, yeah, it was that conversation that convinced me to leave the warmth of Texas to come to <laughs> A slightly colder place in windy city uh, and yeah it was really as i couldn't imagine like if i say no to this i won't be as close to this amazing uh thing that's going on and it's been everything that and more so let's let's kind of dive into um uh the the just for for someone who might not know what reveal is uh you know what is reveal and and why do you think it's so unique well, you know what's interesting about unique, about Reveal is that it measures something that is unseen. It measures something that um, uh, we measure people, how people are feeling about their faith. We measure beliefs. We measure that kind of thing. We measure how they're feeling about their church in terms of whether the church is helping them grow spiritually. And the thing that was different when Reveal was born was that that was not being measured, all right? What, what was measured, because we that was just not part of the paradigm of a church, which makes complete sense. The church and church leaders were just sort of... Um, by default, trapped in this, so what we called an activity model. Church leaders have always wanted to know if they were helping their people grow spiritually, grow in their love of God, grow mm -hmm. in their love of Jesus Christ, right? They've always wanted to do that, but they, they were trapped by not being able to measure the unseen, so they measured the scene. What did you measure? I mean, what did we track all the time in my communication stuff? We tracked attendance, we tracked baptism, we tracked tithing, we tracked whether people were showing up to volunteer. We, we tracked the things we could count, the things we could see. And we got tied up thinking that if more people showed up, that would mean people were growing in their faith. And what happened with Reveal is we kind of, okay, we fielded this one survey and we found out that was not the case. And that is what was unique about Reveal is that while it was launched, and I don't know if you remember this, but the survey was never intended really to find out what was uh, create or, or catalyzing spiritual growth, because we as church leaders knew what was catalyzing spiritual growth. It was our weekend services, small groups. And, and in fact, the survey was intended to figure out whether it was small groups or we had a midweek service, you'll remember, New yes. Community. You taught at it many Got times. It. All right, we wanted to know which one of those things was doing the best job of helping people grow spiritually, grow in their love of God. And, and you know what? Neither one of them were doing very much. <laughs> they were not. Okay, so what was working, which was just astounding, I shouldn't have been, but is how people engage in our faith outside of church. Really, personal spiritual practices just rose to the forefront as being the driver behind. Uh, increasing love of God and increasing love of others, which is how we define spiritual growth. Yeah, what well, Kelly, I have to say, because I mean, uh, you know, this hit me like a ton of bricks too when this all came out. And I think we need to say it again, is that attendance is not a predictor of spiritual growth and spiritual growth or helping people become like Jesus or become disciples is our number one mission. And it turns out for all these years, we were measuring the wrong thing. And that's what I love about Reveal. It gets kind of under the surface of these unseen things and asks the congregation what's catalyzing their spiritual growth. And then how is the church doing at helping you with right. these things that catalyze them exactly. and and, uh, and it's just really fascinating uh, let's give the people that are listening or watching um an idea of like well how big is this thing i mean how many churches have done this and how many individuals have taken it at this point we've had like 20 i think it, it's 2500 churches that have mm -hmm. taken it maybe 600,000 congregants are in our database so they've all taken the, what's fascinating about the, this database, though, um, is because of the reach of the Willow Creek Association, where it was housed for its first, you know, yeah. seven years or so, um, we have a real diverse database. You would think, a lot of people do, that the survey is like a megachurch non-denominational survey, and there are a lot of non-denominational churches in there. One out of four churches in there is a non-denominational church. Uh, one out of five churches is a church that has attendance over a thousand, but one out of four churches in the database have attendance under 250. Yep. We've got every denomination uh, represented in this database. It is very diverse. Uh, we've got Baptist, Presbyterian, Reformed Church, uh, a lot of Pentecostal churches. I, I was just thinking actually 
of the Mennonite churches because I think the people who were kidnapped in Haiti were from a Mennonite uh, church. And I've talked to some Mennonite churches there in the database. So it's like, you know, it's a very diverse database, which gives you the power of reveal really is to take all those spiritual beliefs and attitudes and practices and stuff and measure how not only how you're doing, how are you doing relative to other churches relative to this database? Are you doing better? Are you or is it an opportunity or what's happening? Where are your people relative to some norm that you can um, look at and kind of get a real benchmark about how well you're doing or not? Well, as you might suspect, having you as my first guest, I'm a real <laughs> big believer in this. And uh, to be honest with you, uh, it's powerful enough just getting the feedback, but to compare it with other churches right. uh, has been such an eye opener because you don't know, well, is this good or bad? Uh -huh. And you get it. And uh, I think for church leaders today, um, as it relates to leadership, uh, it, it, the world is way too complex and we cannot uh, build our our initiatives uh, for these people that God has given us to lead simply on what interests us or a hunch. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I know there's still a lot of spirit-led things that are required on that, but I have just found Reveal to give me just unbelievable uh, information that says, as a good shepherd, under-shepherd of Jesus, what should I focus my church on to accomplish the actual mission that we've been given, which is which is pretty pretty dang exciting. I, yeah, I, it's because it's so large. I mean, you know, I, I, I think it probably is the largest, you know, maybe this is not accurate, but I cannot think of another body of information for church leaders that uh, is possibly as big and as important as this, because it's asking the fundamental question about where we are taking our people. Mm hmm that's right. And I, I would say, I think we believe it's the largest database, certainly of its kind, which yes. goes back to this measuring the unseen yep. with the beliefs and attitudes and the church piece to all of that. Okay, so what does this have to do? You know, this is a podcast on Bible engagement. And so um, uh, I remember uh, you and Greg Hawkins, you know, saying, okay, here's the big learnings as you guys gave seminars and and debriefs on that could hear the big learnings i remember particularly two of them could you could you let's riff on those for just a little bit kind of the some of the big learnings all right okay well the number one as you know has been it was that when we did our initial survey and as we analyzed this database as it was growing the number one single greatest catalyst of growth was reflection on scripture. We measure reflection on scripture with a statement that reads, I reflect on scripture every day or day or every week or however often I reflect on scripture for meaning in my life. Mm. So it's not about, it's not about I read the Bible. It's I reflect on scripture for meaning in my life. And this was so powerful. I, I use the metaphor of uh, vanilla ice cream and give me just one second on this. Yes. Uh, yeah. But uh, what we call, um, okay, so if I asked you, what is the most popular flavor of ice cream in the United States? It is for sure vanilla ice cream. And number two is chocolate. Number three is strawberry. Number 10 is pralines and cream, whatever. Okay. What's important about this though, is that vanilla actually, it's a little misleading because vanilla is actually twice as popular as chocolate. Chocolate is twice as popular as anything else on the list. We say reflection on scripture is the vanilla of spiritual uh. growth. It's the vanilla. It is way head and shoulders above anything else. And what's interesting about when we came out with this finding, you'll love this, Randy, is I got so many pastors pointing at us saying, well, duh, like the Bible's important. Like, how is that such breakthrough? finding you know why is that so important and i'd say fine okay if it's so important why aren't people reading it and i had the numbers to prove it okay i had numbers that showed you that like in a, a one church only five percent of the people were reflecting on scripture every day i have never seen a number randy i don't think higher than 45 percent Wow. Higher than 45%. And what's important about that, back to measuring things, right, is that you get a sense of, okay, where, where are your people? I mean, how, we know how many people, and I can tell you, West Side Church, 34% of your people are reflecting on scripture daily, at least based on the survey that you did recently. How does that compare to other things? You're doing great relative to our database average, which is around 22%, not quite at that 45%, right? So it's just, you know, 
now I'm running on about this, but no. it's, it's just, it's a, it's a very powerful um, catalyst of growth and it has been uh, reinforced over the years. I mean, we've been doing this 15 years now and it's just continued to be reinforced the further and further we go. Yeah, we've done it twice here and we're going to use Westside as a little bit of a case study on this, but we've done it, you know, twice in the three and a half years I've been here to try to, and the second time it's really exciting because you get a kind of a benchmark, not right. against only other churches, but we're right. against the last you know, a couple of years that, you, you know, that, you, that you did it last. And so where's there movement in your congregation? And, um, and I also want to uh, kind of skip down to this idea that uh, in reveal, there are um, these movements, right? There's these right, right, movements. Right. Can you describe those? Sure. Because it wasn't just Bible engagement or a reflection no. of scripture, which is more than just saying the Bible's important. And it's more than just giving a sermon. Right. I mean, it's it's the people personally reflecting on scriptures right. to find hope for their life, to find direction for their life. Um, it wasn't just for a certain group of, of Christians in the church. Not at all. Not at all. It was, it, let me, OK, so well, just briefly. All right. We we it was one of the hallmark findings, actually, of reveal is that all churches, frankly, have people who are in one of four groups of spiritual maturity, if you will. The first group is the Exploring Christ group. That's about 10% of the database. Those are people who are really just kicking the tires. Actually, I can tell you a bunch of churches have a whole bunch of people who've been kicking those tires for a lifetime, like for years, all right? So a lot of people kind of can get stuck in that group. The mm -hmm. next group is called the Growing in Christ group. That's the loudest voice in most churches because about 40% of the database is in a Growing in Christ group. Those are people who figured out Jesus is who he said he was and they're just starting to get to know him, and but they are very dependent on their church for everything, for teaching, for, for inspiration, for motivation, for guidance, all that stuff. So they're very dependent on the church. The next group is called the Close to Christ group. That's about 25% of the database. And that group has figured out that Jesus is in the passenger seat when they're driving off campus on Sunday and that they can access Jesus into their life. And they do every day or regularly throughout their week. So they have a real relationship with Jesus that is growing. Uh, the Christ-centered group, another 25%, is the most mature group we have, and they have surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. They're so all in. They're all in. But then, to your point, there are these movements. What does it take to go from exploring to growing? What does it take to go from growing to close or close to Christ-centered? And what's interesting about this is there's only one catalyst that was in the top five of every one of those three movements, and it was reflection on Scripture, back to the vanilla of spiritual growth. That's what reflection on Scripture is is however it's not number one right the number one catalyst for growth this is interesting between exploring and growing in christ is uh salvation by grace belief in salvation by grace and that makes a lot of sense like why would you get to know jesus if you didn't buy into that uh but this this and i'll just tell the second story because it's important is that between that big 40 percent group that growing in christ group so dependent on the church to get to the close to Christ group, their number one catalyst is a belief in a personal God. Wow. Back to being in the passenger seat, you know, leaving the church campus. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe God is personally active in your life, why would you engage with him throughout the week? And that's really the, the straw that kind of moves that, breaks and moves that group into a place of really growing a relationship with Jesus, because otherwise, if you're stuck in that growing in Christ group, sometimes, and I've seen many churches like this, people are, are more on a journey to develop a relationship with their church than they are in a relationship with Jesus. Does that make sense? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm, I feel like I need an altar call here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that happens, you know, and they can get, and people and pastors can get very, um, to some extent, misled because these people will sign up to do everything. They'll volunteer, yeah. they'll do all this stuff, but they're really more engaged in a relationship with doing what their church wants them to do and not really not really connecting the dots to a relationship with Christ. Wow. That is that. I, I mean, uh, the, again, I forgot they were doing a podcast. I was getting ready to take a pen out and start making some notes down again. Cause I've been in this stuff a lot and, and yeah. I, like, Oh, that's right. Salvation by grace. 
and personal God. I mean, right. and, you know, looking at the church I serve, you know, you know, we'll talk about in a moment, you know, in that second bucket, if you will, uh, growing in Christ, our numbers are higher than the average. Mm-hmm. And so even more so, it, right. it, it, it informs me that, hey, what am I going to be preaching on? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I probably need to do a lot of preaching on what does it mean that God is a personal God, that he's involved in our daily lives, that he cares about us, and he's got a plan, and he's got, he's far away and bigger than your problems, but he's really close and he's really near. And and then do it in a way that causes people to reflect in scriptures and putting a like a one-two punch together, right, would be, would be really, really pretty pretty beneficial. Hi, this is Randy Frazee, host of the Bible Roots Podcast, which is brought to you by my friends at Harper Christian Resources. Harper Christian Resources equips you to understand the scriptures, cultivate spiritual growth, and disciple your people with Bible study resources from today's most trusted voices. There was another learning. Uh, so the one is the reflection on scripture, Bible engagement is is the vanilla. But uh, there was another learning I remember you guys sharing about sure. what kind of, what, well, why don't you just- it goes back to uh, the two buckets we kind of look at, which are the unseen things that in the in the hearts of people as they as they experience their faith outside of the church, and the other one is how they feel about how the church is helping them. And what we found is what people want most from the church is helps me understand the Bible in depth. Help me understand the Bible in depth. That's the number one thing. I mean, we measured a dozen, at least a dozen things, if not you know more than that. Uh, and that was the number one thing for all of these groups, the exploring, the growing, the close, the Christ-centered. They, that's what they want their church to be doing. Help me understand the Bible. And that's the second thing they want is help me develop a personal relationship with Jesus. So, yeah. and that's true across all these denominations. I mean, all of them. That's, this is not something that is just part of one um, group versus another. This is, this is uh, across the board. Well, what's, what's, what I like to say when you guys share this um, is that the number one thing that people need and the number one thing people want is the same thing. It's the same thing. So That's you exactly right. Two, yeah, you put the two together and it just really makes your strategic planning session with your church council or whatever pretty pretty easy to say, <laughs> why don't we focus on you know vanilla you know, because it's really what they need and what they want. And if we can do an effective job at, and I think the church in so many ways is, is tried to get really fancy or get out of its lane. And I think the church people are screaming, no, no, the church should do what the church does been commissioned to do uh, and, and to really get better and better at that. Right. You know what, though, I will tell you, it goes back to this personal God thing. The Bible reading and even scripture reflection can get on its own sort of treadmill thing. It can become another sort of activity. I want my yeah. people to be, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, and I, I remember this church in San Diego and this pastor calls and says, I've been trying to get my people to read the Bible. And I, they just, well, I just can't get it going. And I just said, you know, I don't know what to tell you, but I will tell you this. It's not the Bible is not the number one catalyst in that big group. It's the belief in personal God. It's the belief that that you're you're developing a relationship with someone, and that's what all of this is about. Reflection on Scripture just happens to be the thing that really advances that, but that belief has to be in place first. So yeah, the belief is there, and and the and the and the reflection of Scripture is really more of the tool to really highlight that particular mm-hmm. um, sort of a belief, right? I mean. Yeah. It's, it's the spiritual discipline, right. it's the most effective spiritual discipline that's going to catalyze this belief that will mostly catalyze that, that, uh, that growing the Christ group into a closeness to Christ. Correct. Which is pretty cool. Hey, let's talk about Westside and, and kind sure. of bring this down to something personal. Absolutely. And so I'm going to kind of bear, you know, so that we can kind of take it down to instead of 2,500 churches down to one church that has done it actually three times. They did it once before I came. And then we did it once as I uh, first came, and now we've just done it recently. And uh, uh, un- unpack a little bit that, of that from us, because I tell you, Callie, when you we did a Zoom call with you, I mean, our team, particularly our executive pastor, was Jeff, you know, just was beside himself with excitement uh, as we debriefed this with our of our uh, with our. And I'm going to ask you a question, Randy. When we had that conversation, how often did we talk about attendance? I don't think at all. How often did we talk about tithing? Not at all. Not a bit. That's the thing. I, I, I have had just this tremendous gift of talking to hundreds of pastors. I spent an hour with a big Tucson church last week. Not one 
reference to attendance to tithing. And those are not bad things. You need to count those things, right? But we had an hour and you and I had an hour just talking about where your people's hearts are at, where their beliefs are at, how they're feeling about how well you're helping them with all of those things. Just phenomenal. Let's talk about your results. Yeah. Okay. So what was interesting is that you had taken it like uh, two years, two and a half years yep. before. Mm -hmm. Helps me understand the Bible in depth. The number one people thing people want. I'm going to give you a number here. Okay. You guys were at 45. What does that mean? I'm comparing you to all of our churches and you guys were doing as well as 45% of the churches in our database. So kind of right, right in the middle, right? Yep. Okay. Then you took it again and the number almost doubled to 81. So okay. you moved from 45 to 81 in terms of helps me understand the Bible in depth. I already talked about uh, reflection on scripture. The first survey, it was at 20%, 20, one out of five. We're reflecting on scripture daily. When you took it again, it was 34%, one out of three. So good movement in terms of that. This is one I really love. Is This is the best practice church, uh, kind of the best practice for the church that we look at, which calls it's, we call it embeds the Bible in everything. Yeah. Do you embed the Bible in everything? Not just teaching, but in, in kind of the culture of the church, right? And you guys um, in your first survey were at 31. So you were doing about as well as a third of the churches in the database. The next time you were at 75, you went, well, you really just zoomed up in terms of help. And we see that all the time. When we see numbers like reflection on scripture and beliefs move, but more often than not, the first thing that moves is how people feel about the church. And they are just applauding all the way, embeds the Bible and everything, 31 to 75. That was great. Um, and we have a measure, which I'll just throw out there, but called the Spiritual Vitality Index, which sort of brings it all together. And the first, sur in the first survey years was 68. So you're probably as well, you know, doing pretty well. I would call it a strong average. Okay, and the next one, uh, you were, went up to 81. So really strong movement. I don't know what you did, Randy, but whatever you did, we saw this. And what I love about this is it's not about one number. What we see is a consistent pattern, a consistent movement that should give you a confidence that what you're doing is really advancing people's journey. Yeah, I'd like to stop there for a second. And I didn't plan on doing this, but I've got my I keep this thing with me all the times where I go, uh, is that when we take the reveal uh, survey, now first people, most people are going to be listening to this, but anybody watching on YouTube or, or more visual, is that we put together an annual, you know, an annual 20, this is a 2022 plan, and it's just now finalized, it's got little scratches on it, and if you look in the very middle, it talks about focus, and it's basically our understanding of reveal for the 2022 based upon the results and we're showing how the teaching we're doing and the engagement is connected and answering the question as to where our congregation is at so in 2018 when we took reveal and we saw that we were an average uh, you know our archetype was average and and we knew that we weren't uh, where we wanted to be in bible engagement we spe specifically chose not only series that were embedding the bible in more aggressively but we did it with the execution on values with Bible and, and then also engagement. And, and as you know, Callie, with, with Zondervan, uh, you know, I'm the story guy and then followed up with believe. And it's not just about giving the, the preaching, but really engaging the entire church in the experience. So we went through the believe experience. And, and I think that those initiatives that we did in coupled with the, with the Holy Spirit's favor, you know, we were able to see some pretty good movement. So yeah. I, yeah. I agree with that. Now you've tipped into something. You mentioned your archetype, right? Yes, let's, let's talk about that. Yes. Let's talk about those. Okay, because one of the, the um, most recent kind of breakthrough findings from Reveal, and this, this came about actually as the book Church Unique was becoming really popular and with all of its great wisdom, but we were finding that there were patterns of churches in our database. We were finding... Um, or I was sensing in these consulting conversations I was having that you would talk to a church like a big church in Florida and a tiny church in Montana and then another church and they'd all be having similar problems. And then I talked to another church and another church and they'd be having similar problems that were very different from that first group of churches. And what my our statisticians did is they dug into the database and sure enough, they found there were eight patterns of churches kind of like church personalities yeah. church personalities now the first pattern you fit in 
uh, at least in this, the last survey, was average. Average is really a tough archetype. We have about, I think, 13% of our churches fall into that. It's sort of a flat line. It's yeah. like nothing's going anywhere, right? Yeah. And, and it's just like, what do you do with that? Where do you go? And your second archetype was, um, and this one is, is a little less what I'd call intuitive, but uh, was the self-motivated. What Self-motivated meant you really motivated your people to grow spiritually, and they did. We saw it in the numbers I just talked about. But now they want more from the church. There's like, there's this hunger, you know, that you've created that they want more from the church. And just briefly, I, some of the other personalities uh, that are out there, I talked about the, the um, churches where I see a lot of people who are on a journey to develop a relationship with the church, a lot of complacent churches, 20% of our database is in, mm -hmm. is in that complacent category where people are pretty happy with their church, but they are not growing their faith. They're using it. Sometimes uh, I had a pastor reference it as kind of a social club sometimes. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, and then we have a lot of introverted churches. That's another 20% of the database. Introverted churches are um, churches where they are very strong on the intellectual side of faith. They're very strong on Bible study, if you will. But yeah. you just, the heart transformation, you just don't see in their attitude sort of the transformation and the movement if you will into a place of uh, really deep surrender to christ but that they are not moving in that direction they're sort of stuck in this intellectual place that hasn't become a heart uh heart thing for them so introverted churches i've seen them really grow though once once pastors get hold of this stuff they can really move move the dime on this stuff so another group i talked about well which was my tucson church i talked to uh was a vibrant church just all guns blazing i mean people are on fire spiritually and they just love their church all right so so we have eight different personalities i've just mentioned some of them but but what i love to see because sometimes we think like i our personality we can't change very much churches can change they can change and i have seen in every group i've seen complacent churches become uh energized churches which is another archetype um i've seen introverted churches many of them become vibrant i've seen energized churches become vibrant i've seen we have troubled churches i mean that's 14 percent of our database really mm -hmm. it's not just i mean they then you've got a weak spiritual foundation in the people and they're mad at the church i mean that's a tough place to be but i've seen them become average and that is that's a really good place for them to get to and go beyond so all of this should be an encouragement the churches know where they've got challenges but the the opportunities we see are that we know churches can get better all of them can get stronger and that's what we want on you know for the whole kingdom to well, want that yeah cal i mean i've got so many like bombs going off right now. I, I, I like I had twenty things to say, and I might only remember. But a couple things that uh, number one, the the uh, the the uh, you mentioned the inter, uh, in, introverted church, in, introverted uh, introverted yeah. church, and, and that may be really good at the Bible, and that uh, that per, that church archetype needs to understand that that maybe they haven't gone as far with reflection on scripture that they may think, oh, we're really into the Bible study, but it's, it, right. during the Bible study, but it's not a kind of study that leads to reflection and engagement that leads to transformation, right? So, so you got to be, don't deceive yourself that, uh, and really be willing to. And the other thing I thought of is, is that, um, is, is that it's, it's really important to, to take the survey and just let it speak for itself. And just like as a pastor, we tell our people, you you got to deal with the truth about where you're at in your life. You know, the beginning of wisdom is to call something by its right name. And when I came to this church and our archetype was average, I decided not to actually use that language with them because it's not really hard. I pastor an average church, you know. It isn't very fun, no. But we dealt with the reality of what that meant. And now we're uh, in, in uh, January the 9th uh, is uh, when we'll be doing our kind of the state of the church address in a series called The Essentials. And I'm going to unpack, reveal, I've unpacked it to the staff, we've unpacked it to our advisory teams and all, and now we're going to go to the congregation and give them the high line of where they're at. And we're going to celebrate that we've moved to self-motivated. Right, which is it's a move in the right direction. But we're also going to, yeah. yeah. But we're also going to say, but we also are hearing you loud and clear. And you said this, Callie said it's like you've motivated us to grow in our faith. But now we'd really like some help with our homework. Uh -huh. right? right, right, yes. right. So, uh -huh. so that's a that's a, that's a I think another piece. And the third thing of the twenty things that are popping off in my head, but I think is real important, is that you said is that uh, every church, no matter where you're at in your archetype, face the truth of that. 
and then realize that there is hope and there are initiatives. Because you guys uh, wrote another book out of your research of how an architect, what's the number one thing a church in this space right. needs to do? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, um, we what we did is we interviewed churches that we knew had moved from one archetype to another. So uh, we talked to a complacent church that had become energized. So we talked to them and said, what did you do? Right. And we talked to several of them. So this is less statistical and more uh, what I call qualitative in its, in its yeah. basis. But we would find two or three things that a complacent church had done to become energized. We found things that troubled church had done to become average. We found things that churches, and we did it for every one of the archetypes, and that's in this book, and the name of it is Rise, that where we talk about all these strategies. And frankly, if you take the survey like you did, we give you your three strategies when you take the survey. Here are the three things we found, at least, that seem to move a church in your position to a stronger place. And um, uh, one of the big strategies we saw, which you'll love because you have been on this for so many years, is to create a Bible-based campaign. Have some sort of season of where everything from the weekend teaching to the small groups to the children's ministry, where all of it is unified and everyone is learning the same types of Bible stories or talking about the same beliefs or something where you can unify it through small groups, through the family, through uh, all the um, uh, teaching of the children in the school, all, all of it is all coming together. And those things can be very powerful catalysts. It's the number one strategy for a complacent church. Yeah, I read, you know, read that in Rise. And, uh, and, you know, I got involved in Bible engagement first with the story, which you're familiar with. And then, then with Believe, and then some other ones that I've helped out now with the New Testament Challenge, a new one coming out called Abide on how to different ways to engage with Scripture, and then some other ones that we're that we're looking at with uh, with Harper Collins down the road, and and it just we, we got I got into it with uh, trying to help. Um, you know, an individual person in, engaged with scripture in a really ef effective way. And then I found at the same time, it just really elevated the church in every single way, which is really cool. And what I like about what, what you're giving people, and we'll, in the show notes, we'll link to all of the different books from Reveal to Follow Me to Rise, of the, the different thing, because uh, I just want to encourage people to really check out what you guys are doing and and say I'm a I'm probably your biggest fan I'm your poster pastor for this you are I really am because it it just takes the guesswork out for me I I, I go to the congregation in confidence and say hey listen when it comes to prayer you know um, we're below average and that's pretty devastating and uh, I got a lot of work to do and in the, in our new reveal uh, results show that they grew tremendously in yeah. the area of prayer and, and finding direction for their daily life. I mean, we put a lot of energy toward that. And I just feel like I'm, I'm going after that, that spiritual warfare on behalf of our people. I can't imagine, I really can't imagine not having uh, this, uh, this, this research. It's so elegant. And when our people take it, they get an initial feedback too, which is an improvement. It uh, is. From, it right. is improved because they get some immediate feedback, which, you know, in your partnership with glue, you know, a person who does something wants immediate feedback on where they're at in their journey for sure. Hey, I'm going to, uh, I want to give you kind of like be the queen, queen Elizabeth for the day and just tell the people that are going to be listening to this. A lot of leaders, um, pastors, um, you know, just, and we can take it, just speak what is, you know, just on your heart about your biggest frustration uh, that, that you, as you've worked with churches or, you know, whatever, the biggest frustration you have, and then wrap up with kind of the biggest encouragement. Okay. All right. Well, the biggest frustration goes back to what was going on when we started this, which is the, the trap that church leaders fall into on this activity-based accounting heads. I mean, we are counting heads all the time. And even though we know we're trying to change hearts, it's very hard to break out of those habits. Even when you have reveal, it's it's very hard to, um, to break out of that. And I'll give you a really good example. Uh, this church, it was a Presbyterian church in California and they took reveal and I was doing a consultation with them and this pastor was mad at me. I mean, that doesn't happen very often. I mean, he was truly raising his voice. He was not happy. Callie, I did all this stuff that you wrote about, and I did all this, and we had our people do this, and blah, 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 and our numbers are, and he was a complacent church. 
So I said, okay. So until he told me a little bit about stuff they'd done. And you know what I said to him? I said, you know what it feels like to me? It feels like maybe you went from one set of activities to another set of activities. You just went activity to activity without back to the why of it, the why of it. Okay. Wow. And he, and, and he was, we hung up that phone call and he was still not happy with me. <laughs> All right. But he took the survey again, two years later, their numbers skyrocketed. So I couldn't believe it skyrocketed. And they asked for a consultation and I called him or I reconnected <laughs> and I said, what happened? And you know what? He didn't say anything, but his staff did. He said, they said he changed his language completely. Wow. He started talking about surrender, humility, sacrifice. He started talking about a relationship wow. and how you grow a relationship completely changed that. Wow, that is, uh, I mean, uh, inst I mean, I've been doing this for 30, this is my 33rd year, and I don't think I can hear that enough because we get into our intrigue with the activity and the tactics, mm -hmm. and that's what we share with the congregation, but they want to go deeper, don't they? They want to know the why, they, they, the, uh, the, the, the values, the character, and uh, I think so, that some people listening, watching, might be actually doing the right thing, but approaching it the wrong way, possibly, mm -hmm. right? Well, or just kind of losing the, all of this is a means to an end. You yeah. know, the end is our relationship with Christ and growing yeah. that relationship with Christ. And if you lose the message of the end and leave it back here in the doing, there can be disconnects. And, and that's, that's why, and that's story. why the four segments, I guess we could call them, mm -hmm. all of them have to do with your relationship with Christ, exactly. right? exploring Christ. And that's why you didn't do it as, you know, moving from a, a disciple to a leader. Right. You know, it's not about sort of those things. It's really about all about this personal relationship. Who you, exactly, where is your relationship with Christ? How would you describe your relationship with Christ? That's what people get on the survey. So, okay. How about encouragement? I mean, you've been doing this for right, now. Okay. For my biggest encouragement, well, right today is you. I mean, it's pastors, yeah, it's pastors, but it really, I, I, to be explicit, it's the heart of the pastors. Hmm. I do not talk to pastors. I, I've talked to hundreds of them now. They love their people. I've talked to thousands probably, but I mean, they love their people. They want them to grow in their relationship with Christ. And it is, I mean, I've had pastors in tears. I had one pastor who was going through his average church report and he was just tearing up saying he and his staff had just determined a couple weeks before that they were like the church of Ephesus in Revelation oh. where you've done all this work and I love all this work you've done, but you've lost your first love. Oh. And he just, it was just so moving. And, I, and that's the thing. I, from, from that, from, for 15 years, I have seen the hearts of pastors and they are all sold out. They wouldn't be in ministry if they weren't. Yeah. And, um, and I, I know ministry is tremendously frustrating, but extraordinarily rewarding as well. I've seen that as, as I've talked to churches more than once. So, so that's my encouragement is that we have the hearts are out there and, yeah. uh, and if they can get off that activity model train, I yeah. think, I think we can really, really do some wonderful things for the kingdom. Of that God. is wonderful. That's a wonderful thing to hear talking to so many pastors to, just to see where their hearts are at. And it's been a, certainly a very difficult season, you know, with this global pandemic. And I know yeah. there's a lot of discouraged pastors, but I think at the end of the day, uh, most of us got into this because we were transformed and we wanted to use uh, whatever gift we had to see other people transform. But sometimes you lose your way. And uh, I just think reveal uh, has been just such a big help to me. And I think we've done a good job today of sort of laying the case for Bible engagement, for reflection of scripture as being one of the top strategies. If someone uh, wanted to connect uh, with you or take the reveal survey or learn more about it, where might they go? There is, a, well, you'll have a link uh, for them to, to click on to if they want to, but it's really the Reveal for Church website. So Reveal for Church and just type Reveal for Church in the browser and you'll get there. And there's a website where they can find out all about the survey and they can sign up for it. And thanks to Scott Beck, it's free. It's free. And that's new. That's only been a few months uh, in the works. So 
I think that's news for me as well. Aha, uh -huh. there you uh -huh. go. <laughs> <laughs> that is really cool. Uh, well, Callie, I cannot thank you enough. Uh, we could just chat for ever and ever. I totally enjoyed the years that I got to work with you uh, in Chicago, and I'm so grateful to continue to partner with you. And uh, I, I just think we need to probably do this again to dive in a little deeper if you'd be open to that. Right. Awesome. 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 Well, thank you. Well, everybody, I hope that you've enjoyed episode one of our podcast sponsored by Harper Collins Resources. If you enjoyed it, I'd like to ask you to leave us a review and share it with a friend. And here's a sneak peek of some upcoming episodes. We're going to have Scott Beck, who we just talked about, the founder of Blue, to talk to us about the science of how people grow. And of all the people that I know, Scott knows how things grow. He's the one who scaled things like Blockbuster Video and Einstein Brothers Bagels and Ancestry.com, just to name a few. And he's converted all that energy from, you know, bagels and videos to growing the body of Christ. And he's turned his full-time attention to helping the church and nonprofit organizations stimulate growth in their people inside and outside of the church. It's going to be a fascinating episode. And we also have Kyle Eidelman. Kyle is the senior pastor of Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, one of the largest churches in America, a personal friend of mine, and he's the author of some of the greatest books like Not a Fan, and uh, he's also one who works with most of the Christian movies that have come out like I Can Only Imagine and uh, I Still Believe on Jeremy Camp and really puts engagement strategies around those wonderful. So we're going to talk about uh, the role of story uh, in the area of Bible engagement. I think you're going to enjoy that as well. So thank you for joining us. I'm Randy Frazee. See you next time. Thanks for listening to the Bible Roots Podcast. We hope you were encouraged and energized by our discussion today. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love for you to leave a review. This small gesture will help more church leaders discover our conversations around Bible engagement. And don't forget, like and subscribe to our podcast so you'll never miss a new episode. Now, may your faith be strengthened through God's word today and every day.